Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hyperspace on the Dark Matter Digital Network. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, and a special thank you to webmaster and producer Keith Rowland. And my special guest this evening is Mary Joyce. And since 2008, Mary Joyce has been editor of the Skyships Over Cashiers website, which deals with UFOs and other cutting-edge topics. Her career also includes working for a Fortune 100 company, coordinating art and printing for talking children's books. In that capacity, she worked directly with the creative teams at Marvel Comics, Golden Books, Mr. Rogers, Bill Cosby's Picture Pages, and Steven Spielberg's E.T. Book Staff. Early in her career, she taught in an experimental non-graded inner city school and later held promotional positions with the world's largest private printing company, an air pollution control agency, political campaigns, and a community college. Her books are available on Amazon.com. She's also the author of Cherokee Little People Were Real, and also, she has a new book coming out called Underground Military Bases Hidden in North Carolina Mountains. We'll get more information on that tonight. Her website is www.skyshipsovercashiers.com. And please welcome Mary to the program this evening. Hi, Mary. Hi, how are you? Good I'm to great. Be on your show. I appreciate it. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on tonight. So thank you for joining us. And if you can just speak a little bit louder, that would be awesome. I will do my best. Okay. Great. So, so let us know what's going on with you. I know that a lot of new things are starting to happen. And so why don't you fill us in on your book, first of all, the new book coming out? Um, the book just went to the printer uh, yesterday. And it's called um, Underground Military Bases Hidden in North Carolina Mountains. And we have, uh, we've featured the uh, uh, secret bases that are throughout the Appalachian Mountains. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know people out west know about the things under Area 51 and some of the other western states, um, but not that many people know what's going on in this part of the country, and that's why I did the book. Excellent. And, and when's that going to be out? Um, it, they'll probably have it to me before the, it be by the first of next week. Uh, and then the next step is to get it on Amazon. Now, the other books are already on Amazon, but you always have to go through a process to get another book on there. Um, but early in July, it should be there for anybody to get. Excellent. And, uh, it, uh, uh, anytime I do um, a book, um, I kind of have a magazine approach to it. There's always lots of photos and uh, maps and, and things so that you have a visual experience, not just a reading experience. And uh, I've done that with all my books. And uh, uh, many years ago, I was in the newspaper business, did Sunday magazines, um, you know, lots of layouts in addition to being an editor. And I know the importance of the visual. So hopefully it'll be another book that people will find interesting at both levels. Oh, absolutely. And of course, the underground bases is always intriguing on so many different levels. And, and you know, you're, it's interesting, your audio is starting to drop a little bit. And I'm trying to see if we can get that booted up a little bit more. Um, I hate to have to reconnect the call. Can you can you try and talk a little bit louder on that phone? I, does this help at all? I mean, if you just kind of raise your voice a little more. Project, okay. I, I know you have a really nice speaking voice. You know what's interesting? Before the call, you were um, a lot more clear and a lot louder. So that's, Which that's is very puzzling, isn't it? Yes, it is. So I'm wondering, if do you want me to go ahead and, and re- reconnect the call, Kate? Just to give me a shout, and I'll do that because we could try to get her back. Are you right over the microphone on the – well, it's, it's a phone, right? So you're you're right there over the receiver, right? I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see where we're at with this, and then we'll just keep going through it. I, I was going to try to reconnect that call, so we'll we'll see what we want to do. Okay. Great. Thanks, Keith. All righty. Well, let's talk a little bit about. I, I want to touch base on your Bigfoot information. I know you have some new information that you'd like to share with everybody. Um, this is actually kind of a fun project that we did with the website, and uh, uh, we went up to a valley. Uh, in the high mountains here. And to get there, we had to take, you know, some winding roads, and then we went down this ravine road that was one lane, and uh, suddenly it opened up into a bowl-shaped valley. And the uh, owner of the land, um, you know, invited us on, and they have actually... Uh, moved out of their house because there's been so much Bigfoot activity. And on the website, Skyships Over Cashers, um, we have pictures of their footprints, their fingerprints, their their writings. What's very interesting is that they, you know, have gone into the home, and they kind of learned how to do it by steps. You could see where they tried to uh, learn how to, to open doors, and, and there's scratch marks where they tried to pull uh, underneath doors and pull them open. Um, the part of the house that is the most disturbed is where the children live. And um, 
they haven't lived in the house for two years, but these Bigfoot have gone in there and uh, have just made themselves at home, and they actually have gone from, it's like they've evolved. They've gone from taking a Sharpie pen and just kind of doing scribbles on the wall, and then you begin to see things that look like attempts at drawing, attempts at writing, and we also got a very large clump of Bigfoot hair uh, without stretching it out. It's kind of in a curled form. Uh, it's about six or seven inches. There's a picture of it on the website. And we sent uh, some of that off to a, a lab that does DNA testing. It's, uh, as I understand it, it's the same lab who's do that's done work for uh, some of the major archaeological finds like the... Uh, elongated skulls down in Peru. Mm -hmm. So it, it should be a good lab. We just have to wait around for um, about a month to find out if it, you know, proves to be uh, a Bigfoot. Right. That's so fascinating. Did they ever set up any type of surveillance equipment or cameras to try to capture images? The owners did, and they didn't catch a Bigfoot. They, they caught something that was equally perplexing. Um, it's a, a little, they call it a little alien dude, and it's very, very white. Um, it's not like uh, you're like a gray, but it has oval eyes, extremely white, bald, and uh, at one point, she uh, caught it on the game camera carrying two little, what she calls, uh, hairy brown babies. Wow. So there's got to be an interaction with the Bigfoot and whatever this creature is. I've seen lots of uh, drawings and illustrations and photos of different kinds of ETs. Uh, I've seen one vague one of what she's gotten, and it doesn't quite look like anything that I've seen. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mysteries. In fact, this whole area in western North Carolina is full of mysteries. Uh, we have the Bigfoot. Uh, we have the little people. Uh, we have UFOs, we have the underground bases, so if you want some, uh, you know, mystery to to solve, this is the place to come. Right, yeah, definite hot spot without a doubt. That's fascinating about that little alien dude, huh? Yeah, we haven't figured that out yet. Now, what's interesting, and, and I, I know from your background you understand mysteries like this, uh, the gal who is, we call her Samantha, um, she had all these photos on her computer, and it got wiped out. Now, she still has the uh, memory cards. Whether or not we're going to be able to get pictures from her and put them on the website, at this point, I don't know. That is certainly the hope that we have. Mm -hmm. That would be fascinating if you could do that. That'd be incredible. How, how tall was that little alien? She's estimating like two or three feet. Oh, that's interesting. So it almost sounds like they could be interdimensional or something. And that's certainly, uh, well, that's been associated with the Bigfoot for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, where they'll just, you know, suddenly disappear. They seem to be very telepathic. Uh, this whole thing started um, uh, when they went to uh, fix a dam. They have a pond on, on the land, and the, the dam needed to be fixed. And when they were drilling with a jackhammer, they hit something hollow. And there's a lot of caves in the forest that, like, encircle this uh, bowl-shaped uh, valley. And so she was guessing that it was another cave, perhaps one they lived in. And that was the turning point. That's when they started having um, uh, experiences with the, with the Bigfoot. Now, she says that all along she has uh, felt that, you know, somebody was watching her from the forest, but she never saw anybody, and she never had any troubles. But after that, they began to get uh, big, uh, muddy footprints, or not footprints, handprints on their vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, she said you could see, and I did see some of these photos, uh, you could see where they were trying to figure out how to open the door, and they would try prying and, you know, a whole lot of different things before they actually got the door open. And then once they got inside, they had their, uh, as she said, muddy prints on everything. And there were indications that they had tried to turn dials. Um, and at one time, they turned on the ignition. It, the engine didn't start, but the lights came on. Mm. And another time, um, she still goes there sometimes to do things, but she had... Uh, things in one of those uh, clothes dryers where it has the window and you can watch the clothes toss. She left it running, went to town, and when she came back, there were these big uh, foot, you know, handprints all over that as if they were trying to figure out, you know, how the clothes were tossing. Well, they sound like kids. 
Yeah, they do. And and my own feeling for having walked around there is that uh, the ones that go into the children's room are juveniles. Um, obviously, the big prints on the cars and on the doors aren't the juveniles. But a lot of the drawings are done below the light switches. And I don't think a real full-grown Bigfoot would choose to get down and draw pictures below the light switches. Right. And uh, so it just seems like it's... Uh, kids trying to learn stuff right and what is the time duration between them going over there and, and drawing and things like that how many hours are we talking about i i don't know if i can answer it that way they moved out of the house uh two years ago okay but they uh, uh she has what she calls a bodyguard and, and she still goes there just about every day to to check on the property and she says just about every time they go back they find something new and uh, the day that we went there uh, the new thing that was there was right in front of the front door, and it was like this rag had been shaped into like a little basket, and there were some old, three old coins in it, and something that was like gold, kind of a gold brown color. It was almost like it was a gift, mm-hmm. um, and maybe it was a peace offering. I have no idea, right. but I have heard of other Bigfoot giving uh, people presents. Uh, you, you know, when there's a good interaction with the people. Right, I've heard she that al- also. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. She also felt like um, she may have contributed to the Bigfoot being upset because she was very interested in their rocks, and she would collect them. And she said, I did not see this, but she said some of the rocks had, like, carvings on them. She, she thought some of them looked like owls. Mm-hmm. Um, and she felt like she had taken those and, she felt like they were their stones, and they didn't like that. So she feels like two things annoyed them. Mm-hmm. And right. That's fascinating. Did did they capture any audio? No. Uh-uh. Okay. Or but they've crazy? heard it. And again, uh, those kind of responses that she told me are very typical. Uh, you hear the, the whistle sounds that don't sound like a bird. You hear owl sounds, and many of the carvings are also owls. Now, they're not carvings like you and I would do. You have to bring a little bit of imagination to it. But you can see the owl uh, face in many of the things that she's collected. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the typical sounds of taking large branches and banging on trees and, and, and you know, just the standard Bigfoot type thing. That's really interesting. You know, it's real interesting about the Bigfoot when a lot of people would dispute it and say, well, maybe it's a bear or a big animal or maybe somebody out there in the, in the wilderness. But, but you discount a lot of that, don't you? I mean, what's your Oh, absolutely. That? And not just because of her story. A, a couple of years back, I interviewed a man for the website, and he lives uh, on the edge of one of the national forests in this area. And he's kind of up about, I think, about 30 feet above like a creek. And he's off an old logging road. And um, he eventually befriended a a family. It's uh, a male, a female, and two adolescents. Um, And the the male will come around by himself when the man is uh, working in the garden. And they will. He shares some of the food from the garden with them, so it's quite phenomenal. And the people I've talked to who've had the Bigfoot experiences, um, they don't want to pinpoint where they are because they want to protect the Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So when he shares the food, does he just leave it out for the Bigfoot? Mm-hmm. Oh wow, that's right. Really and what he does is, he, if he has leftover food. Um, he will take it down by, I think he takes it down by the, the creek where they often will go and play in the water. And uh, they always come and get it. Uh, one night he was, the first time, he was sitting up on his porch. And again, he's up above the creek. And he has what he calls a street light by his uh, garage. Now, it's not a street light in a city. It's just so he can see his garage when he comes up this logging road. And one night he saw... Uh, uh, the whole family go across the road and he eventually realized that was a regular path for them just like animals have a regular trail they go on and what was interesting it's always the female that crosses the road first followed by the children followed by the male and uh, I just find that all very very interesting Mm-hmm. Me too. And it seems to me like they like to be around water or, or a source of water of some kind. Well, I think they need it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And but behind this man's um, property, it goes straight up a mountain, and it's straight forest. So there's no development back there. So it's a pretty good place for the Bigfoot to be. Right. Uh, the lady that I was telling you about, Samantha, her property is being more and more encroached by human development. So, you know, it, the Bigfoot's in a more precarious position. Mm-hmm. Right. It'd be interesting to see what the uh, the lab analysis is, that information comes back. Um, it will go on the website. Right, again, yeah. If people want to check on it, it, we probably won't know until middle of July on that one. But it's skyshipsovercashers.com, and uh, uh, we'll certainly put it on that website. Right, and I saw the hair sample. I saw the, the picture of the, the hair, so it's quite interesting. Well, because of that photo, that's the reason we were contacted by somebody who wanted to have the DNA testing done on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so for people who have learned quite a bit about this, they thought at least the photo looked like a convincing sample. Right. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'll be checking in with that in about a month, then. That's going to be fascinating. So, so can you elaborate a little bit on, on what guided you to start the website, Skyships Over Cashiers? I know you said it's a hot spot in so far as um, all the anomalies over there, but what really pushed you in this direction? Well, the way it started was um, we have a friend that lives up in Cashers. Now, Cashers is what you call uh, a high mountain community where it's a lot of people come there when the weather's nice, and then they all evacuate at wintertime, so it gets kind of quiet in the winter. It's kind of a high-end community with, um, you know, people from the lowlands. Mm -hmm. Um, And we got a call from her one day, and when I say we, I'm talking about Evelyn Gordon, who's the the co-owner of the website, and she, she, the gal's name is Glennis. She said, you've got to see what my daughter just took. And uh, what had happened was um, her daughter was taking pictures of the sky, and she was eight years old at the time. And the reason she was taking pictures of the sky was the night before her mother went down to the refrigerator to get a late-night snack, and her backyard seemed to be lit up, and she thought... She didn't think the moon was full. And she finally went and looked, and there was a low UFO hovering over her backyard. Well, the next day, she's talking about that uh, to her mother. There's like three generations in the house, the the mother, the grandmother, and the eight-year-old. And, of course, the eight-year-old is hearing all this. So that was what was inspiring her the next day to take pictures of the sky. And she was at the parking lot for the uh, grocery store in the heart of this little community of cashers and got this perfect stereotypical uh, UFO smack in the middle of the sun. Now, you can't see that with your bare eye, but when they looked at the photo she took, it was just as clear as day. That was the first thing we ever put on the website. And um, from there, it just kept growing. Mm-hmm. We just had more and more things happening. We've had UFOs land up there behind her property. Um, uh, it's just quite fascinating. Wow. Did she ever um, get into close co- contact or proximity with the craft insofar as it landing? Um, the craft landed on like a, like a hill that was near the road. And it would be maybe a football or field in length away from her, maybe a little more than that. It was a small, what we call scout craft, and it just landed on the top of this ridge next to, I mean, it was part of a a horse paddock. And so she saw it from her car, from the road. Um, Sometime after that, we did an experiment. We had somebody who doesn't know a thing about dousing and gave the woman uh, uh, some dousing rods and put her in this large paddock and told her that the UFO had landed somewhere in that paddock and to just use the rods to see if she could locate um, where the landing spot was. So she starts at where she thinks is the most logical place that a craft would land, and nothing's happening. She's walking around, nothing's happening. Well, when she gets to the side of the paddock, which is where the ship had landed, the, the, uh, the rods crossed, and it, she, she had no idea where it had been. So we found that as a uh, kind of an interesting experiment. Mm-hmm. It certainly is. Yeah, I like dousing rods. I've worked with those too. Those are fun. Yeah. What, so what size was the craft? You said one was a scout. Have, have there uh, been other large craft? Um, we probably have had every kind of variety up there. Uh, the more recent ones within the last couple of months uh, have been very, very odd. Um, some of them... Um, 
look like asteroids. It's mm. like they're in disguise. They're not lit up. Uh, you, she can see them with her eyes. Uh, we put some of her photos on the website under Skyship Photos. And they do. They look more like uh, asteroids. It's like they're trying to camouflage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've had some like that. We've had uh, round orbs. Uh, we've had them in different colors. We've had them flash uh, rainbow colors. Um, it, it, there's, you know, just all sorts of stuff. That's fascinating. And what about visitation? Are there a lot of contactees in this area as well? If there are, they're not talking. Really? Okay. So we're not getting any of these uh, firsthand um, uh, face-to-face uh, stories with people in that area. Now, I have interviewed uh, somebody who you may know, Michael J. Carter, mm-hmm. uh, and he has had experiences, but he's in Asheville, right. which is about 45 minutes um, east of where we are. Mm-hmm. So we, we have had people who've had the experiences, but right in Cashers, I don't have anybody, unless this little alien dude that's on the Bigfoot land proves to be real. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting right there. And the correlation between that and the, and the, uh, the Bigfoot, I find interesting. Well, it's the first. I haven't read anything like that before. So no, I haven't. It's another either. mystery that needs to be solved. Right, yeah, but if there is a correlation, which it sounds like it almost, uh, that that could be very interesting, yeah. Mm-hmm, yep. That sounds like another book for you right there. <laughs> who, who knows, who knows. But uh, uh, having been in the newspaper business for a bunch of years, I have a full-blown curiosity, and it's just uh, very interesting to pursue some of this stuff. Oh, right, yeah, and I applaud you for what you do, and I love your website. It's awesome. I encourage everybody to take a good look at that. It's really good. And I do want to touch base with your book, Cherokee Little People Were Real. And insofar as, uh, what's the story with this? How did this all unfold insofar as the little people? Um, I moved here in 98. I'd never heard of Cherokee Little People. It was all brand new to me when I began to hear it. Um, I live fairly close uh, to the uh, Cherokee Indian Reservation. And uh, the Cherokees would talk about it. Um, the white people would pretty much dismiss them as like, those are just old legends, no big deal. So I didn't pay much attention. And then one day, a man came in where, to where I work, a very well-respected man in the community, a World War II hero. He was a pastor for over 40 years. Um, just a genuinely nice guy. And I had talked to him a number of times. And one day, this subject came up, and he said, no, they're real. And he said after World War II, he had worked uh, on some of the construction projects at Western Carolina University, uh, which is in Cullowee, North Carolina. And when they began to do some of their construction projects, they would find these little tunnels. Um, the hub, uh, the, the most important building on the campus is called the McKee Building. And it's been a, a high school, it's been... Uh, a grade school. It's been uh, part of the campus now. And when they first cut into the ground to build it, which was back in the 30s, um, they found uh, two little tunnels going east of the building. And these tunnels are roughly uh, two feet across, uh, three and a half feet high. They are, all the tunnels have been made in this real solid, dense red clay. And they are square cut except on the top. And on the top, they're arched. And if you know anything about engineering, that makes the tunnel stronger. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I talked to um, uh, Johnny Clayton, who had been involved with that initial construction. And then right after World War II, they decided to expand the building. And they did something that's um, not that difficult to do in the mountains. You can't do it in flatland. Um, but a two-story building was turned into a three-story building by digging underneath the building from one side. So on the front, it's a two-sided building. On the back side, it's a three-story building. And when they did that construction, they found uh, three tunnels going in the opposite direction. Um, The irony, if you appreciate irony, is that um, uh, Cherokee Studies, as part of the university program, uh, uh, those studies are done in that building. And in that basement level is where they have the anthropology department. Um, I talked to the head of um, uh, facility planning, and he's an architect and is you know, involved with all the construction projects. 
And he said, yes, he's seen uh, the little tunnels down there. Uh, they are now hidden behind a new wall that they put in to reinforce the building. So here you have the anthropology department on one side of the wall, and on the other side of the wall, um, you have these tunnels. Mm. And it just seems so ironic. If I was in charge, they would at least cut a window out so that the world could see them. Right. But uh, that's that's the irony of the whole thing. It's almost like the they're univers- The university uh, is like so many institutions. They're more concerned about building new buildings uh, than you know, preserving the history. Mm-hmm. And whenever they have done major construction projects, maybe I shouldn't say every time, but many times they have found these little tunnels. When they put in sewer lines, they found little tunnels. When they built other buildings, they found little tunnels. Um, anyhow, they're That's, just it's kind of a network of them. Right. It just amazes me how they avoid researching and investigating the history of, of uh, something so significant, in my opinion. That's my opinion also. Uh, Since that book came out, which is called Cherokee Little People Were Real, uh, I got a letter from a man who was a student uh, back around 1999-2000. And he wrote to tell me that when he was a student there, he and his buddies were down by the river. There's rivers everywhere around here. And they were just, you know, goofing off. And the head of security came by carrying a box. It was like a He said, a little bigger than a shoebox. And they started a conversation with him because he was technically off campus. And the guy just spoke very freely to them and said that uh, they'd found some more of these little bones and they were, he was going to rebury them off on an ATV, I mean, yeah, all-terrain vehicle trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said they were finding them, you know, oftentimes. But instead of stopping building projects, they simply took the bones and buried them somewhere else. Wow. So was there a burial site there, like a a real burial site, or did they just find these bones random? Well, many people thought there there were two um, pyramids on the campus at one time. They referred to them as the small one and the big one. And they thought that those were burial mounds. Well, the old timers said, no, that wasn't the case, because they always remembered that there was a vertical tunnel going straight down into the big mound, And at one time when that land was farmed, the farmer would take big logs, a number of them, and stick them down in this hole so the cattle wouldn't fall in and break a leg. And it got filled in later. Well, then they began to do construction, and many of these tunnels led to that. And the old-timers who were involved in these construction projects said that was just a pile of dirt from these um, tunnels originally being built. And... uh, you know, hmm. it's uh, it, it's quite interesting. Yeah, it certainly is. And how deep down did they have to go to find these tunnels when they were doing their construction? Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, trying to figure it out. All right, you know how deep you would go for a basement. Mm-hmm. So, in the digging of a basement, they would have found these these tunnels. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious as far as how deep it was. That's really fascinating. Yeah. And is there a description insofar as how, how high or how tall were the little people? And, and also well, about clothing and things like that. Uh, there are, uh, there's nothing that would indicate clothing. Okay. I mean, nothing at all. Um, probably the, the best artifact that they have um, is a, a, a skull that looks like a child's skull. And for the longest time, it sat on a science professor's desk like a decorative paperweight. And he always referred to it as a child skull from the Indian Mound. Well, one day, another teacher came by and picked it up and looked at it real carefully and said, this isn't a child skull. It has all of its wisdom teeth. Um, so I found that very, very interesting. And quite a few people knew about these things. Wow. I ended up interviewing 11 people for uh, the book, Cherokee Little People Were Real, and all but two of them were invo- involved with the construction projects in one way or another. Uh, and they happened everywhere when they were putting in the, the um, uh, concession stands for the football stadium. Uh, they thought they were building on virgin land, and they had it all leveled out, and uh, they were going to pour cement to make it flat. And the cement began disappearing down this hole. 
and they couldn't recall. They said it was at least six, maybe eight truckloads of cement before the cement quit disappearing, and it didn't show up anyplace else. You know, it just Mm -hmm. apparently filled one of these holes. So lots of, you know, very strange things have happened. They um, were expanding a parking area near one of the buildings. And again, they did a vertical cut into the mountain so they could create like a ledge for parking. And when they did that, they found some more tunnels. So uh, they just found all sorts. It must have been a very large community at one time. It certainly sounds like it. So, And what is the connection between the little people and the Cherokee? Uh, they're known around here as the Cherokee little people, the, but when the Cherokee arrived, the little people were already here. And the Cherokees originated from the Great Lakes re- region. And when they arrived here in western North Carolina, they found these little well-tended gardens, but they never saw any people. And one day, or one night or whatever, they found, they saw these little people come out from underneath the ground, tend the gardens, and take uh, things back underground into these tunnels. And originally, the Cherokee referred to them as the moon people because they came out at night. Mm-hmm. That's cute. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. And and <clears throat> to add to the confusion, there's three different descriptions of little people. The the most common one is um, are the ones that look the most like the Cherokee people, just a smaller version. And the people who live in the deep parts of the reservation say that they they still have some little people that live in the mountains. Um, and some of those people I've talked to are very convincing that uh, that might indeed be true. <clears throat> do they still have so, visitors then? Pardon? Do the do the little people visit them in some way? Yeah, what, what some the of these people still will put food out for them. And what's interesting, they will say that if they don't put the food out, their roof will get, like, um, pelted with little pebbles as if to remind them mm-hmm. that they've been forgotten. Uh, there seems to be uh, pretty much a general affection toward the little people. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the little people that were first found here don't seem to match that description because they were described as having a blue tint to their, their skin and the big uh, oval eyes, which sounds much more alien. Mm-hmm. And then to tie another piece together, uh, another old timer, um, uh, when he was five years old, after a major flood here, the kind that makes the history books, um, lots of the topsoil was just, you know, washed down the river. And he found a little um, medallion, uh, oval shape, maybe about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter in, in size. And it had a face on it that looked just like um, a leprechaun. Mm. And there was a leprechaun face a profile on each side of this medallion. The man called it his lead head because it was such heavy metal. Um, That's interesting. And, you know, there's another description of a creature, uh, and you just have to wonder what in the world was happening around here. Mm-hmm. Um To make it more complicated, uh, not right now, but earlier, the Cherokees did not like one type of uh, little people. The ones with the red whiskers, they wanted to kill off. Mm, Interesting. Yeah, so that's you have a leprechaun, you have one that looks like the Cherokee, and you have a description with the blue skin and the big eyes. Right, yeah, that definitely sounds alien to me. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's almost like it ties into the fairy kingdom or the fairies in some way. What do you think about that? Um, I hear that, uh, I've read about it, and I hear that from some of the Cherokee, but what I'm talking about are real physical beings that um, seem to be about uh, uh, maybe three feet tall, three and a half Mm -hmm. feet tall at the most, and these are flesh and blood uh, creatures, not just little little fairies. The fairies may exist, but that isn't what I um, have written about. I think that's fascinating. That's so so cute. Well, I heard the old stories where you leave the spirit food out, and you never know what's going to to take the spirit food now, if you live out in that area, right? <laughs> Wait, I I didn't understand you. Go ahead. Oh, well, you know, there are a lot of uh, mystical practices where spirit food is left uh, for the for the spirits, and you right. put it out. But you know, I'm thinking about that associated with with the little people to some degree, insofar as just giving them something. Right. 
That's kind of interesting right there. I'm very intrigued by the blue skin and the oval eye. Um, I think that's very interesting as well. One of the people that I interviewed, one of the two that uh, wasn't involved with the construction projects at the campus, um, was a woman, and I only knew her as Ruth Beck. And when I originally did these interviews, it was uh, the original ones, was, uh, I did those back in 2000. And I simply wanted to record the information because most of the people were in their uh, 80s, close to 90, and nobody had recorded this information. And I did not intend to write a book. I simply wanted to preserve the information. Well, the more I found, um, I decided it needed to be in a book form, <clears throat> which is what I did a year ago. Mm-hmm. And in the process of updating it, um, I was looking for photos, and I was looking for a photo of Ruth Beck. Well, she had passed away, and I found her obituary. And it wasn't till then that I found out she was the great great granddaughter of Solly, and Solly uh, is a, a hero of the Cherokee. And her theory on the little people is that they originated from the stars, mm-hmm. which is not totally um, foreign to the Cherokees because they believe they originated from the Pleiades. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me as well. And whatever happened to the skull with the teeth? Uh, according to an anthropology student that I, a uh, graduate that I interviewed, uh, she said it was hidden away in the forensics lab at the university. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'm surprised a private investor didn't get, get that one. Uh, um, part of my hope is that people who are archaeologists and really have the credentials in that field could get a hold of this book and use it as a starting place to to do some more research. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think everything there that could be found has been found. I agree with you. Yeah, I think there's a lot more to it, for sure. And, and do the little people have a connection to other tribes in addition to the Cherokee? Um. The, if you do a lot of research, you'll find out there's uh, uh, little people in many, many cultures, like with the, the, I think they call them the Menahuni in Hawaii. Um, they have the little people uh, associated with the Mayans, mm-hmm. um, of course, the Irish. So uh, the race of little people, I think, has been a worldwide phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I tend to agree with you on that as well. And, and was there ever a language of some kind or anything that, that was reflection or a reflection of a language? That you've uh, been able to access? I have not found anything. There, There is another puzzle in the area. There's a, uh, a petroglyph stone here. It's known as Judicola Rock. Uh, I went out and measured it one day. It's approximately uh, uh, 20 feet by 15 feet. And it has um, uh, carvings all over it. And nobody has been able to decipher it. The Cherokee don't know what it means. Uh, you know, nobody's figured it out. It was here before the Cherokee arrived. So there is speculation that perhaps the little people did that, but I don't know how you're going to ever prove that. Right. Well, it sounds like they're still in the shadows somewhere, almost like the Bigfoot, and so perhaps they, they still uh, dwell on this planet. Well, if the Bigfoot can ev- you know, evade all of the people that are searching for them, uh, it would be so much easier for a little guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. That's fascinating. I find this story very, very interesting for sure. Have, have any UFO anomalies been associated with the little people? Um, I have no reports of that. Okay. I was just curious if there was anything like that. It would strike me. That doesn't mean that might not be a possibility. Hmm. I just have no reports of it. Yeah. And when do you think the little people appeared on the map and so far as that location? What's your estimate? Um, I have no way of knowing. Okay. And I haven't found anybody who has a good answer. Uh, I, there, when I talk about old-timers, I'm talking about people who, when I have talked to them, have been in their 80s, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. And one of the old-timers uh, who used to be a professor at the university um, is very much interested in archaeology. And one day he came in to where I worked at the time, and he had a little uh, stone earth mother figure. Are you familiar with that term? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, the strata that they found it in um, was, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Oh, that's interesting. So these mountains are are here are very old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds They're like it's certainly the oldest in, in the United States. Right. It sounds like quite the hot spot for everything. Mm-hmm. 
And of yeah. course, I did want to dive into the bases just a little bit. And so far as what, what other information have you acquired through the, the underground and so far as what, what you think is down there in the military installation? Do you think it's a, a black technology base or do you think it's just strictly military government? Um, Probably... <laughs> I don't think there is one simple answer. Okay. Uh, one of the places that uh, we've gotten reports on uh, from a military guy who was the head of a squad uh, that was uh, doing surveillance at Mount Mitchell, which is a, a well-known tourist place uh, here in North Carolina, and uh, uh, they saw uh, troops uh, from different countries working, you know, around Mount Mitchell, mm -hmm. and lots of what he calls blue hats, which are uh, people with the United Nations, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they trailed them. Or his his squad followed them, and uh, watched them put uh, sensors into the ground all over that mountain, uh, so that they would be able to hear anybody coming that direction. And they observed uh, trucks bringing tanks, um, somewhere between twenty and twenty-five tanks, um, up to the top of that mountain, and then the trucks never came back down. Um, mm. Things like, you know, uh, every, every base I'm getting a, a, a different um, answer, but that one seems to be very much as associated with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow. Right. That's very interesting. Well, it doesn't surprise me at all, and I've heard stories about that as well. Um, not necessarily there, but just, just the UN, the whole thing about the shadowing of the UN encroaching in the in the United States right now. And of course, a lot of people don't believe that, but I, I do think something's afoot in my well, one of the One of the things that uh, puzzled everybody is why are we seeing troops from different countries, including Germany and Russia and the United Nations, uh, why are we seeing them here in the forest mm -hmm. and on the parklands? And when I started doing research on it, um, I found out that during uh, President Nixon's uh, administration, the United States signed a tre treaty, I think it was the World Heritage Treaty, and many of our national parks and historic sites are now under the authority of the UN. The idea was to protect them, but that now makes, it's like we don't have jurisdiction over the property. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And uh, I, I had to look that up for myself. I'd heard rumors. And, uh, yeah, it really is a treaty. Mm -hmm. It's very concerning on so many different levels. And, and, of course, I just observe everything, but I'm very, I'm being very aware in so far as what's happening here on, this, on the timeline in, in America right now. So, yeah. Do you have any insight on Jade Helm 15? Um, I, I've hesitated about doing anything on the website about it because I get mixed signals. Mm -hmm. And I hate, I don't. I'm a, I just am not going to print something that I don't have a clear answer on it or of some kind. And I would be happy to hear what you have to say about it. Well, right. actually, I've been doing research, too, but, I mean, I'm very cautious, too. I'm very neutral. To me, it seemed like a PSYOP. It seemed like something that was psychologically preparing people for something very big. And, and I don't. I think a lot of people are getting really worked up about it, but that's part of the PSYOP is, is to psychologically affect them. So that's my take on it, energetically speaking. I also um, was, was paying attention to some other... Some other people like Alex Jones, you know, I tune into him once in a while and see what he's up to. And, and he does make a lot of sense with the geospatial intelligence. Uh, they were talking about that. Um, there's a, and you can actually access this video. But, but he was talking about geospatial intelligence and so far as what the agenda is about with the Jade Helm 15. And it makes a lot of sense. So it's, it sounds like they're acquiring data and they're using um, high-tech equipment to do so. That's my own impression. Part of, you know, and I also have a sense that it's pro probably connected to artificial intelligence, just from my own background. So that's my own take on it. And of course, with artificial intelligence, anything goes because that thing can integrate anywhere. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's the ultimate eye in the sky, if you ask me. But you know, I don't get paranoid about it. I just find it interesting and I monitor it because really, um, it, it's important to pay attention to what's happening here in America and not get too lost. And I, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing on so many different levels, because even with it, when it comes to like the little people, um, there's information that we need to uncover that has been completely cloaked. So, you know, regardless of what it is, what species it is, or species rather, what it is, it's important that we, we access this information or try to find it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really appreciate what you're doing there. Yeah, well, I was one, curious. Of, one of the stories that we did was uh, on the website again, was um, uh, evidence of um, an ISIS camp just over the border in Mexico across from the United States. Uh, it's in the southwest, and that's the same area where the Jade Helm operation is happening. 
some people think that that's being uh, activated down there as a possibility of defending the border. Uh, there's people who think that uh, it's just an excuse and a preparation for uh, martial law and that they keep trying to uh, do something to instigate a need for martial law. Um, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Right. Yeah. But we did find photos that were very convincing and put them on the website because uh, that the ISIS camp there seems to be very, very real. Mm-hmm. And just before that, we had um, a man that we call Hawk. He's the one who did, did the surveillance of Mount Mitchell um, with the U.N. and all that military activity there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also has uh, done surveillance on an ISIS cell that's just uh, northwest of where Mount Mitchell is. And then he's also done surveillance on uh, an ISIS training camp. Mm-hmm. And at that camp, he saw... Um, Let's see. His, he said he saw uh, Hispanic, uh, French, uh, United Nations, maybe German. He saw somebody with an actual swastika on his armband. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is apparently part of the military that doesn't like all this being turned over to other forces. Mm-hmm. And so there apparently is a very active group within the military that is trying to prevent some of this from happening. I think that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that because it seems to me sometimes that, that the civilians are kind of left in the dust and we're all alone and we don't have a backup system insofar as what's going on here in this country and the possibility of it being taken over by what I would call hostile forces. Now, what's interesting too, and I don't want to get too political. I know we were talking about the little people and UFOs and now we're going here. But but, but anyways, um, when you think about it, the borders are wide open. I mean, literally that was sabotage. That that to me is sabotage in, in so far as allowing anyone and anything to come over. And, uh, you know, to me, that was a red flag right there. As soon as they right. said they were going to just keep the borders like that and let everybody just come over and, and nobody's, you know, nobody's doing anything about it. That to me is just... That's that just smells so bad to me. So that they're they're simply allowing it, and that's that. Yeah, it stinks. Right. Yeah. So that's something I'm looking at as well. But I, I do uh, I do agree with you insofar as I think there are sleeper cells here, and I think that there is something brewing. And I'm not paranoid about it, but I think people should be very very aware and uh, grounded, and also very uh, enlightened insofar as you know just just being aware of what's happening here in America because something's not right. And right. I don't have to put you know special glasses on everybody. I think everybody's kind of tuned into that that there's something wrong. Yeah, right. No, I mean. uh, this man that, uh, uh, the man we call Hawk, uh, he, part of his story was quite surprising to me because one of the people that he uh, did surveillance work with early on uh, at one point uh, threatened him with a knife um, if he talked about it to anybody. Mm. Now, why? I mean, that left Hawk wondering, where is this man really coming from? Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't think he really knows. No. Yeah, well, like I said before, our freedoms are getting encroached upon from day to day to day. And I think people are so calibrated to the transition that they're not really noticing what's happening until it's actually gone. Right. So that's what I see anyways And so far as what's what's here. They do say something uh, supposed to happen at the end of September, supposedly mid-September, late September. There might be some big transitional things happening. They're also saying something uh, possibly incoming. I don't know if you've looked into that at all uh, from outside our atmosphere connecting in and uh, possibly creating some big changes. Have you heard that too? Uh, I've not with a time date on it. Okay. Yeah. Now they're, they're kind of projecting. I don't, I don't believe in time to me. That's just kind of, I don't really use time like the way people do, but, but anyways, they are uh, quoting late September, mid September. So I was interested in that well, as well. The, the Jade Helm thing starts in July and goes to September mm-hmm. also. Right. Yeah. Well, I would say just it keep- sounds like, it sounds like the fall could be a very eventful time. Right, absolutely. You know, what's interesting to me is, you know, with the Jade Helm going on, what about the black technology projects underground? You know, it seems to me like there's two worlds living, simul- you know, simultaneously. So we have Jade Helm, we have the uh, ground troops, so to speak. But then there's the other people with the exotic craft and the technology and the hardcore stuff, the artificial intelligence. So what are they doing with this? And you have to ask yourself, and I obviously don't know, but I'm interested in so far as what is the counter for that? Are they part of it? Are they enhancing it? Are they working with them? Um, have you had I think I think at some of these underground facilities, uh, there is a um, uh, cooperative effort going on between our military and our black ops operations and aliens. Mm-hmm. And when that's going on, I really don't think they're teaming up with what I call the good aliens. 
Right. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. And I also am under the, well, obviously, from my background, I'm well aware of the, the mind control and, and the uh, psychotronic programs and the artificial telepathy, of course, holographic projections and things that they do as well, which influence the mind. And I think you even touched on, on one of your, uh, I believe it was an interview you did, um, but you touched out, or excuse me, touched on wiping out the memory, didn't you, at one point? With some of um, yes. Now, that the, I get those kind of reports the most from uh, a, uh, an underground facility we refer to as PERI, P-A-R-I. It stands for Pisca Astronomical Research Institute. It was a Cold War military monitoring um, facility, and then after supposedly that shut down, uh, it has been turned over supposedly uh, as a, uh, an astronomical uh, research place. Uh, and on the surface, that's what it looks like. You see the you know uh, satellite uh, things on on the on the uh, property, um, but. I'm told from several cre- credible sources, uh, especially one man who is uh, deeply involved with um, uh, high security projects, that uh, it's a city. It's it's uh, six stories deep, totally self-sufficient, um, and I hear things about uh, psychological, um, you know, experimentations going on there, Mm -hmm. that they have the ability to wipe out memory. My own direct experience with that is that I have been to the front gate of it. I deliberately have not gone in there myself because of what I do on the website and because the times I've been there, um, there's this very disturbing, disoriented um, electrical type interference. I mean, you can mm-hmm. feel like it, your mind's being messed with. Does it sound like a directed energy weapon of some kind or feel like Perhaps. One? I don't know. Maybe they just send out a, a vibrational type thing that, you know, kind of repels people. Does it have, uh, um, do you notice if it's giving you vertigo? Um, somebody else has reported that at uh, the site that's uh, at the Smoky Mountain National Park. Okay. Yeah. And so, that isn't, I didn't experience vertigo. I just, it was a disoriented, unpleasant kind of feeling, you know, like somebody had plugged some electricity into you. Right, yeah, well, I'm well aware of their technology, and I do know that they have some that can actually um, create vertigo and actually create an interference pattern and make people disoriented. That's why I asked. So, so yeah, yeah it sounds- well, in the, in the book that's going to be coming out, I do have a report from a woman who, again, has some background in the military, and she got real nauseated when she went to explore the, you know, the site where construction was being done. Um, she was one of the people that was exploring uh, uh, vibrations coming from underneath the, the earth. Uh, she described it as uh, sounding and feeling like somebody was driving, um, I think pylon is, a, is the right word for like uh, supports for bridges. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have um, in the book again. Uh, I quote a uh, uh, former um, sher- uh, deputy sheriff, and he has heard uh, mechanical sounds coming from beneath the ground where there shouldn't be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, you know clearly there's been evidence, and we've had um, uh, many people talk about feeling vibrations in their house, <clears throat> and sometimes these would only last for. Uh, maybe a few days, and then it would stop. And uh, there's, in my opinion, and in the opinion of uh, a U.S. Air Force man that I've interviewed, um, there's a whole tunnel system that goes beneath the Appalachian Mountains, um, probably originating up there at the original um, underground facility at Mount Weather outside of Washington, D.C., and goes down the whole um, Appalachian Ridge. Right. And uh, Makes sense. Yeah, we've, I, had, okay. we've had reports, you know, uh, you know, near Atlanta and under the ground near Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I've interviewed several people as well who have um, had access to information, and, and and they've confirmed a lot of what you're saying insofar as the underground bases and so far as how they're also interconnected, and this is globally as well. So, so we're right. dealing with a, a really big underground facility that's kind of right. extended. And when you and talk people about people, don't realize it, but there are these uh, underground. Um, boring machines that are like the size of a a train and they can some of them can go uh, dig a hole for seven miles in a day Mm -hmm. so that would explain why there would be 
um, those mechanical sounds and the vibrations and the grinding that only lasts for a while and then quits. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense right there. Well, I call it the Black Umbrella Project for various reasons, but but it's um it's an artificial intelligence array system that's connected into that underground, and I know that. Um, but but we can get into that another time. But this is very fascinating. Now, when you talk about Perry, weren't there um, UFO anomalies also associated with this and triangular craft? Um, not so. Much. We've had reports of triangular craft. Uh, okay. The ones that I have heard the most about around Perry have either been low flying ones. Uh, and also reports of some going in and out of a lake that's just to the west of Perry, which could be an underground entrance, you know, that would meet somewhere underneath the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the people has pretty much clammed up to the whole world about some of the stuff he's seen. He lives near there, and when he, whenever he's talked about it, uh, he claims that his computers get wiped out and I think he just had enough of it. Mm-hmm. But he's very close to there, and he's one of the people who's reported the UFOs going into the into the water. Right. That makes a lot of sense. I suspect they probably use some kind of a hologram um, insofar as maybe maybe cloaking the uh, the site itself to some degree. And also, I wanted to touch with you on the hologram that was a uh, hologram of Jesus that was seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, like I said, we have the whole gamut here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the woman who I mentioned briefly earlier, her la- her first name is Glennis, and uh, she has had a whole lot of experiences, everything from little orbs in her yard to UFOs hovering over her yard and to the UFO landing and the different kinds. She's gotten many photos of different kinds of UFOs, so she seems to really be right smack in the middle of a hot spot. Well, one day she was on the second floor of her house, just stretched out like on a day bed or something and looking out the window and she looked up and she saw a UFO high in the sky and she didn't pay any attention to it because by then she had seen plenty of UFOs and then suddenly there was this beam of light that came down from that and hit um, the parking area to her house And then she heard this real big bang on the side of the house, and it scared her, and she kind of froze for a minute. And then when she turned, she saw this huge hologram of Jesus, and she estimates the size would have been like 35 feet because she knows the height of her house. And it stayed there for about 20 minutes, Um, and it it was like his hair was... She said his hair looked like it had just been freshly washed, and it would just kind of blow gently like in a breeze and describe them, you know, from top to toe. And the thing that stuck out in my mind from her description was that he was wearing a thong type necklace with a little pouch on, on this uh, thong necklace around his neck. And in any depiction I've ever seen of Jesus, I have never seen that. Mm-hmm. And yet it makes sense, because they did have money at that time. Apparently, they weren't real good at pockets, and maybe that's the way coins and things were carried. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, it did last for, I think she said, about 20 minutes. That's, that's a number of years ago. I, if, if, if Whatever's on the website is right. right. Um, whatever I say right now might not be exactly right. Well, that's okay. Was there a conversation or just a projection? Um, it was telepathic. Okay. She went from being very, very um, uh, distressed by the sound and worried to having this sense of peace. Um, I think she got more to it than that. But uh, what made it doubly interesting is that her mother was Jewish and she was raised Jewish, so she wasn't inclined to be uh, fabricating images of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. And, of course, there is uh, talk of the Project Bluebeam. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah, and it, and it could be that, too. Right. And well, it could be a lot of things. But what that project does is kind of ping off of people's belief systems. But if she was Jewish, then that wouldn't, wouldn't really resonate. But still, um, maybe to influence her with another deity or another, another type of being, an ascended master. That's very, very interesting. Um, yeah, we'll have to get back into this when we return. We're going to have for a break. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back okay. at Dark Matter. Vid- ah, can't speak right now. Dark Matter right. Digital.
everybody to Dark Matter Digital Network, and I am Solaris Blue Raven, and this is Hyperspace, and I'm here with my very special guest, Mary Joyce. And Mary, you with me? I am. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's well, that's real fascinating about that um, the projection of Jesus. I find that very interesting, and I, I know that you you noted Jesus is a cosmic being, or that's how you referenced him from our future or another dimension. And I really like that. I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Um, I've written another book. It's called Tangible Evidence of Jesus, Left Behind, uh, Left Behind for Us to Find. And it gives a different perspective on Jesus. Um, for one thing, which blows conservatives' minds, is that he was called a rabbi. And at his uh, time in history, in order to be a rabbi, you had to be married. In order to teach children, you had to be married. Um, and then they, there's people like uh, Professor King from Harvard who has found uh, and authenticated um, some ancient writing where Jesus is talking and mentions his wife. Um, so we get into a lot of things, uh, including descriptions of him. And he, um, at the very beginning of that book, we have um, two letters that were written to Caesar uh, one by Pontius Pilate, and as you, as everybody knows, there were no televisions, radios, magazines, pictures at that time, and apparently Jesus was making enough of a, a commotion that Caesar was interested, and Pontius Pilate wrote this letter to Caesar about Jesus and describes him as being um, uh, much lighter than his uh, uh, the people that were around him, and uh, what we found was in old um, um, Indian legends that predate the arrival of the white man, uh, he is also reported to have appeared to uh, ancient Indian cultures throughout the Western Hemisphere. And again, they described him as being in, having lighter features. Um, sometimes they use the term that his eyes would be changeable like seawater. Um, but always uh, the lighter eyes... And the Indians described him as having hair that would have um, tints of, like, copper um, in his hair. And, uh, uh, you know, he's just a, a quite different description than what we um, are led to believe. Right, exactly. Well, and I, so do think, I do think he's a man from the future mm -hmm. who comes back periodically, and I don't think he is the only one, but periodically comes back uh, because mankind needs a booster shot. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, they have the Ascended Masters. I mean, if anybody's into mystery school teachings, they're obviously in resonance with master, the um, the Ascended Master Consciousness, and of course, what we reference as star beings or, or light beings, and he strikes me as something associated with that, the higher, higher consciousness beings. And of course, I believe right. we're extensions of that, too. We are star beings. We just have amnesia to some degree. A lot of people do anyway. Or dumb down somehow or another. Oh, absolutely. Well, take a good look at everything that's been censored and edited since the beginning of man-made time, and there you go. I mean, right. you have to uncover, and that's why I like the work that you're doing, because you're uncovering information that's been lost to some degree. It's been hidden, mm -hmm. and of course, we're just trying to recapture everything and put it all together, and, and, and pieces are missing of the puzzle, and sometimes people confiscate it on purpose, and of course, there's all that the other stuff that goes on. So One of the... Um uh, things that's in the book, Tangible Evidence of Jesus, um, gets into the burial customs at that time. And um, what they used to do is they would uh, build these caves into a, a hillside. And it would be like a square room in the center. And they would make these burial niches off in the, you know, to the sides of it. <clears throat> and when somebody died, they stretched them out in the main room, in the main square room, and left them there for like a year until only the bones were left. Then they would collect the bones and put them in an ossuary, which is a stone a burial box. And they would put those ossuaries in these niches on the side walls of these burial tombs. And uh, Dr. James... Tabor and a man whose last name I do not know how to pronounce, but his first name is Simcha, um, they did a lot of archaeological research and found uh, the family burial tomb, and it's quite convincing. Um, the custom was to put the person of honor in the first niche to the right as you walked into the tomb. And in this particular tomb, in the first niche, there is... Uh, an ossuary that's inscribed 
uh, Jesus, well, I'm doing it in English, obviously it's not in English, but Jesus, son of Joseph. Then there are two other ossuaries in that very same niche. Uh, one is a woman, and it is, um, on the side of the ossuary is the name Mary, but it's written in uh, a nickname, an endearing, loving kind of nickname style of writing of, for the name Mary. And in front of that name is the word in English, Mara, which is like the feminine form of the word Lord. Very unusual for a woman to have that title. Mm-hmm. And the third uh, ossuary in that same niche says Judah, son of Jesus. Um, it's very unusual for um, the nicknames to, to uh, like the nickname for Mary, to be on Jewish ossuaries. It was not the custom. And in another niche in the same tomb, but on another wall, there was an ossuary that had another nickname, and I may not be pronouncing it right, but it looks like Josie. And that was the nickname that Jesus gave one of his brothers. So here's another nickname, another exception to the rule, in the same family tomb. Um, it's fascinating stuff. It's and they have done, um, they may have done more, but at the point I learned about it, they had done DNA testing on the male and female in that first niche, and there was no uh, genetic link. So it wasn't his mother, it wasn't a sister, it wasn't a blood relative, mm-hmm. which would indicate more that it could very well have been a wife. That's fascinating. And where's the location of this tomb? Uh, outside Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's just very, very interesting to me. Very, very interesting. So. And in the book, <clears throat> again, I mentioned early in the first hour that whenever I do a book, I like to have lots of visuals. And that particular book is thin, but it is packed with, with photos and, and location maps and uh, so, and also information, so you can go and explore the topics more deeply yourself. Mm-hmm. My purpose in life is to be a link between, let's say, the researchers and the people who are interested but really don't like to read, and try to bring important information uh, in spoon-sized um, mouthfuls so that, um, you know, anybody can find some very fascinating information without having to drag themselves through, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of research. Right. And sometimes a lot of the data that people have access to isn't accurate. So it's always good to have some alternative information in there so they can decipher and decode at their own pace with their intuition. I still think intuition is is the one, uh, you know, beacon to truth insofar as being able to read through everything. Because sometimes you look back in the illusion of history, you know it's been edited and censored and modified. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it, even when it comes to religion and belief systems, I mean, that's a sketchy area, and I hate to say it, but it's true. Mm-hmm. So, you know, where do, where do people go when they've been lied to for century after century after century, and then all of a sudden something comes comes around the corner that's completely opposite of, of what they've been taught, but actually is the truth? Do you know, uh, um, or at least know of, uh, Bob Dean? Mm-hmm. Uh, are you familiar with his Jesus stories? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I, I did an article on the website about him, <clears throat> and he had a very significant uh, near-death experience, one that I'm surprised he came back from at all. But um, he talks about uh, Jesus, again, being a man from the future and being um, very approachable. I mean, he talks about, uh, uh, I think he almost refers to him like a buddy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find that very interesting from a man who was uh, very invo- involved with um Oh, uh, I think it's the War College and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Well, you know, it's the co- I call it the Cosmic Christ, but it's uh, Ascended Master Consciousness is the way I relate to it anyway. It's that same frequency, and, and of course, uh, I think some, some people who are religious-oriented probably see it differently, but, but that's the way I resonate with it. Mm-hmm. Which is very, very interesting. But I think you're right. I think you're spot on about the star people and the star beings and and his lineage, which is really a celestial lineage which I think is one of the missing links, which, of course, they leave out to some degree. Um, without a doubt, yep. yeah. It's fascinating. But it's a much more fascinating story, and even though what I present in that book um, goes beyond what you would get in traditional uh, Christianity, it's not something that would in any way diminish somebody's Christianity. If you uh, open your mind just a bit, it actually makes it more wonderful. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah. I agree with you on that one. Well, you know, I always thought religion was a barrier. That's my own perception and, and take on it, that it's, a, it's an obstruction. It's a derailment to what we really are as multidimensional beings. And we don't need a middleman. I mean, we have all the, the tools and components. I think that's what the Master Christ was actually trying to teach. It was the transfiguration of the atom and, and uh, higher consciousness. And, of course, you know, the initiations through higher consciousness. And, and that's part of one's spiritual progression. It was never his purpose to be worshipped. Right. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, so it's gotten derailed, and of course, like everything else here on this timeline in the illusion of the planet, I mean, things have gotten perverted and distorted, and I guess we're, we're trying to create more balance now, and, and setting it right. And you're trying to do that, I'm trying to do that, and thank goodness there's a lot of other people who are trying to do that. Absolutely, and I, I, like I said, I appreciate you being on with us tonight. It's wonderful to have you on, and we can go in so many different areas, which is really lovely. And also, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the website is... Um skyshipsovercashers.com and uh, if you open up uh, you know at the very top on the left it gives you all sorts of contact information um, uh, my personal emails there um, so anybody can reach me excellent and have you ever ran into any problems insofar as your research goes or had any uh, monitoring or surveillance done uh, very very early on um, I had an um, I have a different computer now. I've not had the problem since then. But uh, it's the only story that's kind of dramatic as far as interference goes. And at that time, I had 10 UFO files on my computer. I mean, folders. And uh, I always unplugged the computer at night so that, you know, it wouldn't get wiped out if there was a, an electrical problem. And so one night I unplugged it, went to bed. The next morning I turned it on because I wanted to print out an article or a letter. And all the UFO folders were gone, every single one of them. And no matter how I searched, I could not find any, any sign of them. Sure. Um, I contacted a man who at the time uh, was responsible for um, fixing the computers at the university. A uh, real nice guy, and he came over to my house, and he spent quite a bit of time, and he said, I have never seen anything like this. I've, he said, I can't even find traces of it in, you know, the deep files of, of the computer. And he said, I've never seen where just one subject of, of files disappeared and everything else was left in place. Hmm. That's but that's the only time that I've had something where it clearly looked like I was, you know, having interference. Right. Sounds like somebody remotely accessed your, your computer. Somebody who was very technically smart. Yeah. There's a lot of them out there. That's for darn sure. They can get in and out and you won't even know what happened. Mm -hmm. Sad to say. But, um, well, that's why we have backup systems. <laughs> <laughs> Exterior Without hard drives. Doubt. That was early on. I had much to learn. Well, at least it's not happening anymore, so I'm glad to hear that. But, you know, it's interesting. They don't want the, that information out there. And, it, and still, to this day, um, they still get a little weirded out when we start talking UFOs. And if we have a really good case or something very solid and concrete, uh, there mm -hmm. seems to be some problems with that, disclosing it. Um, this is kind of on the subject. Um, very, very early on, when we, f uh, in, when we first started the computer, uh, the um, Skyships over... I can't talk anymore. Uh, Skyships over Cashers website. Uh, I wrote a small article for the Cashers paper. Now, Cashers has one streetlight, so we're not talking a big town. And so it's a small newspaper. And we wrote about um, the first sighting of the UFO and the little girl's photo. And about 10 days later, I got a call from a man who was involved with MUFON in another part of the state. And he said he'd gotten a call from a man who wanted to know if he knew anything about what was going up in Cashers, that uh, uh, one of his relatives uh, flew on Air Force One, and they were talking about that article in the Cashers paper on Air Force One. So don't tell me there's not stuff going on around here. It's mm -hmm. quite incredible. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that tells you something right there, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. But it also helps you. There was a, um, I suspect he's not living anymore because at the time we had contact with him, he was in his uh, 90s. Um, but we had done a series of photos on the website that I called Blue Moon Photos. And what was happening was anytime I aimed the camera at the sun um, in the middle of the day, 
I would get this blue orb that would show up around the sun, and it would it would often move. It wasn't always in the same place. And I took lots and lots of these pictures. And one time I got one, and there were orbs encircling that. So you had a what I call a blue moon or a blue orb with orbs around it. And uh, uh, Glennis Heenan, who I've already mentioned to you, she took it to a man who lives up there on the ridge near Cashers, and he had been involved with uh, the, designing the Hubble telescope. And he looked at that photo and said it was not a photographic anomaly. It was something else. Mm. So, uh, Interesting. Yeah, most of the time they'll try to say it's lens flare or something. Oh, yeah, but these orb you don't get orbs around this thing, you mm-hmm. know, if it was not not the way we got it. Right. Uh, it's rare to get that. You usually just get the blue orb. Right. Um, but And sometimes it looks white. It looks white at a distance, and if you zoom in, it, it begins to look blue. Well, that's interesting. You know, what, you know what amazes me is that, you know, obviously with all the chemtrails we're getting these days and the geoengineering, you know, you can look outside and see how, how everything's blocking the sun. We have no real blue sky anymore. And, of course, with that comes, if there is something out there, well, it's hard to see it uh, because of all this, this milkiness in the skies. That's, I guess that's true. We still get some nice clear days. We've had a nice clear day today. Did you? But okay. uh, sometimes the uh, the chemtrails can really totally cloud the sky. I was going to say, because where I live, we get slammed all the time. And that's the one thing that bums me out because I love to sky watch. And I live up high up an elevation where I can, you know, watch the stars at night if you see them and, you know, whatever else is out there. But, yeah, if there's chemtrails and they do it at night, uh, it's really, really difficult. So One of the stories we did was... Um, on this, on one community that's not that's on the edge of the Cherokee Reservation, and I kept hearing about people who were getting sick in that area, and nobody else was getting sick. It wasn't like a flu bug going through the community. And I started asking questions, and they all lived in the same area. Well, then I found out more, and they were getting buzzed about every 12 days by the uh, C-130s, which are like the workhorses of the Air Force, Mm -hmm. the big clunky kind of planes, and they would fly over at treetop level and, uh, you know, drop something, spray something, and people were getting sick. And uh, I don't know what the situation is right now, but after we put the article on the website, um, they at least got temporary release. That that seemed Mm -hmm. to stop for a while. But people were getting um, serious respiratory problems for the most part Mm -hmm. and cancer. And people who were young and shouldn't be, you know, getting real sick, or some of them died. It shouldn't have been happening. But this was obviously some kind of a guinea pig project. Mm-hmm. It certainly sounds like it. Well, I know they disperse a lot of um, toxic chemicals in those, uh, in that whole, whatever you want to call that mixture they disperse into the atmosphere. I mean, they can call it whatever they want to, but I, I right. do it, believe it. Yeah. It goes from everything from chemicals to uh, biologicals. Right. Yeah. Aluminum, I know, and mercury. I heard, actually heard mercury from someone, um, some other things that are in there. Yeah. It's all it's all noxious stuff. It's not healthy mm-hmm. and it gets into the water, um, obviously. You know, I used to run outside all the time because I love to run and I, I don't even like to do that anymore unless the sky is clear it's because clear. of the, it's really affects my lungs. So I can, I right. can confirm that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's stuff out there that's just not healthy for us. And, of course, I think we're getting bombarded once again. And that's the geoengineering aspect. And you have to ask yourself, I mean, are they just bouncing radar signals across the sky? Is that what they're doing, you know, with all the chemtrails? Or are they blocking the sun deliberately because they don't want us seeing what's going on and with uh, what's happening with, with all these different types of craft that are out there? I mean, it can go from A to Z. Right. And you can go from the benevolent to the awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, because um, years ago, I lived on Cocoa Beach. And during the time I lived there... I began to notice that the sun was getting whiter. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when the sun looked more yellow. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, perhaps some of that is an attempt to um, to block some of that out. Perhaps it's just dispensing material so that the harp uh, mechanisms can, can work better. I don't know what it is, but... Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that's that's part that's of it. Good. I mean, yeah, because I, I do know that they can bounce signals a lot easier when, well, it's a weaponized atmosphere, let's put it that way. What they're doing is weaponizing the atmosphere. And, right. and it's working. It's working quite well. Right. I mean, that's an old Tesla thing. So right. um, unfortunately, I think we're getting so bombarded with dirty electricity and electromagnetic pollutants and, and other things. And of course, you know, with, with implants and, and technological array systems, <laughs> I mean, it's a, mir- it's a miracle we are, we're not zombies already and, and, you know, half whatever. 
So, well, we got to keep rooting for these people, like the ones within the military who are trying to uh, take a stand against some of the stuff that's happening, right? And uh, encourage more people to to do that. Mm-hmm. I so agree, and I'm really glad to hear that. By the way, sometimes it feels like there's there's nobody listening in the in the military. Mm-hmm. It's on our side, you know. And then the ones that are are kind of uh, that have been coming forward are older, and they're kind of dying out. So, are you familiar with a? Uh, uh, the Promise Keepers. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and those are uh, law enforcement and military people who uh, have sworn that they will not bear, take arms against their fellow citizens, no matter what happens. Right. Yeah, that's that's um, that's very reassuring as well. Well, I think when push comes to shove, I think everybody's going to have to stand up and be counted, and and hopefully won't get to that level. But I do see some some devious things going on behind the scenes. So not, people don't like to hear that. You know, they just want to live in the fuzzy bubble, but. I can't live in the fuzzy bubble when I'm getting, you know, <laughs> people are in my uh, backyard. <laughs> I, I think extremes get people off balance. Mm-hmm. Um, we find the people who um, don't want to hear anything bad, and they become ostriches. They won't even watch any of the news. Right. And I think that's a mistake. Even if we're getting um, manipulated with the news, it's good for us to know what's being put out there. I agree. So we can't be ostriches. <clears throat> and at the same time, we can't be dwelling on the negative all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a firm believer that the more you focus on the negative, the more you draw it to you like a magnet. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Velcro. There's no doubt about it. It polarizes. Right. Yeah. Right. That's why it's really hard. You have to kind of be that neutral, stay in the neutral energy. And 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 keeping the balance today is much more of a challenge than it would have been, you know, in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it was so nice back then. Can you? Are you old enough to remember that? Well, I'm. I'm, I'm a little. No, I was born in the '60s. Uh, should I give my? Right, it doesn't I matter. I'm ancient now. I didn't think you were old enough for that. But but I mean, I grew up in a nice timeline where we didn't have all the stuff that's going on now, and I appreciate mm. that. I really do. And when you think about it, when you're growing up, you don't realize what you have until you get older, and you're like, wow, that was really kind of nice. You know, we didn't have mm-hmm. anybody bothering us when we rode our bikes, and you know, we didn't have cell phones and all that stuff, and the computers and all that. CNN had a special um, about the 70s. I didn't see the whole thing, but what I saw was just pleasant, easygoing entertainment. And I'm going, I hope that inspires some more people to produce some more shows that way. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing wrong with being entertained and making people feel upbeat and optimistic. Uh, We've had reality shows with people with absolutely no... uh, scruples, manners, anything, right. and and they're they're uh, on TV, and I'm going, this just shouldn't be all over the place. I agree. Yeah, there's no etiquette. There's no respect. I totally right. agree with you on that one. Yeah. My mother wouldn't take us out in public if we didn't behave. I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't come from a hard-ass family. I mean, I came from a normal family where, you know, we had protocol. You don't behave a certain way in public. Right. But nowadays, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> they just let them run loose, right? Right. Yeah, this is crazy, you know. We used to be able to fly our kites, and, you know, we where come back you, to dark. Where did you grow up? In, in upstate New York. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, but it was really, I mean, I'd ride my bike all day, all night, and I'd come back, you know, and it wasn't a problem. We didn't have creeps, you know, at that, well, we might have had creeps, but I didn't notice them, and we didn't have any problems growing up. So, things change. Drastically. Mm-hmm. And now it's like everything is it's so surveillance oriented and it does concern me because we have so much of a there's a, there's a need to misuse technology here right now on the timeline with with certain divisions and we have to be watchful of that. Well, if it's any encouragement, I'm a short term pessimist and a long term optimist. Yay. Well so am I. Sometimes I get cynical though and I have to snap out of it when I do that, but I <laughs> I, I usually catch myself when I do. <laughs> we digress. But but still it's good. Um but where did you grow up? Um, Montana, Minnesota, and Michigan. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. The, the, the three M's. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting. I'm sure a lot of the listeners can relate because it, there, was, there was a happier time. It was a more peaceful time. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without and I'm, I'm grateful yeah. for that moment. And I, I, I look back and it's kind of like, I don't want to see America go, go black. You know what I mean? I don't want to see it go down and it just become this nulled out area when it had so much potential. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we'll get that thing rolling in the right direction. You know, there's one thing I was going to ask you, and I saw this article on your website pertaining to a white triangle. And I found that interesting because we always talk about the black triangles, but never the white triangles. Do you you saw that that on our website because it's not ringing bells right now. Uh, Let's see here. It was a white triangle UFO over Leicester, North Carolina. Hmm, Okay. All right. Well, anyways. We've had so many many stories on that uh, I 
can't even keep them off straight. Hey, well, I was anymore. curious if you ha- we- maybe maybe it'll ring a bell at some point. But I thought it was interesting because we're always talking about the black triangles. Yet this was a reference to a white triangle, almost like okay. a, a light ship. Okay. Well, Leicester is uh, uh, close to where we are, are, so it's probably one of our stories, and it has left my brain. Well, that's okay. Uh, maybe I hope they didn't put a block on you. <laughs> no, my brain is capable of leaking. Okay, well that's good. Well, that's not good. But I was going to ask you: Do you do you have any recall in so far as light ships, opposed to more solidified ship, ships that look like reverse engineered technology? Um, we have we have both. Uh, we've had reports of the uh, low flying ones, uh, especially the triangular ones, that I'm pretty darn sure are created by humankind. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, some of these things, I just can't believe that humans have done them. Um, so I think we get the full gamut here. And that's where you have to get back to the intuition that you've talked about. You have to trust that gut feeling. Uh, if you encounter a UFO and everything inside of you says, don't mess with this, then don't mess with it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you just have to go by that gut. That's your ultimate protection. I so agree with you on that one, too. Yeah, well, it seems to me like they do have a lot of reverse-engineered technology and craft. And, and when you have sightings like that where you know it's, uh, your intuition is telling you that this looks like ours, our man-made, you have to ask yourself where they're parking these things. Right. You know, I mean, obviously, they, they can go in and out. Okay, that's great. But where are they parking them in the end events, you know, at the night, you know, when they <laughs> go into their underground? <laughs> I always wonder about stuff like that. You know, I ask the, the different question. But, you know, I understand the true off-world species and, and the craft. But then I wonder what they're really doing with a lot of their their reverse engineered craft. And I still think it's interesting that they're not really deploying it full speed ahead insofar as really showing off globally. Mm-hmm. You'd think they'd want and to... They, do- they also use it to uh, spy on uh, other countries. And if everybody thinks it's a UFO that's flying over uh, Syria, then, you know, they can get away with more. Right. And of course, that, that also leads into the mind control and the psychotronic Project Bluebeam t- uh, type stuff, because once they start projecting images, whatever it is, whatever deity it is that they worship over there, they're going to say, oh, look, we had a we had a sacred vision. And then all of a sudden, you know how that can go. So, yeah, there's there's a potential to really misuse and corrupt so much information, and, and uh, especially when it comes down to holograms. Well, I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but uh, let me ask you a question. Um, your your uh, build is... Um a buster of uh, the mind control MK mm-hmm. Ultra. Mm-hmm. How in the world did you get into that? I'm sure <laughs> your I'm sure your regulars know this, but can you give me? Oh, this? they'd have to Google me, and that's ter- that's terrible because I have trolls. But, but there's a book I have a documentary out too called Either Remote Disclosure and Covert Technology. But it's based on a book I sent to somebody who was high profile in the music industry, and uh, within like a week I had my home completely bugged. My computer was tagged and. Uh, I started getting pulled into a program with the communication system with artificial telepathy and interface with pattern recognition and programs, numbers, codes, serial numbers. And it went into training and programming and then went into harassment, interrogation and torture. And it's mm. and that maybe the listeners on the station don't really know much about this. And, and I have done a few interviews over here, I think, a while back. But, but you can access my books on um, Amazon.com, I the Remote Black Operations and Areas Beyond 52, which talks about the induction, my experience and the anomaly signals that are still embedded in my in my body today. So, yeah, it's a, it's an insidious program, and that's why I, I stood up and I, I talk about it and I communicate the information. But, yeah, it was I never saw it coming. I'll tell you right now, I never saw myself getting pulled into that. I had a happy life and a professional career, and I had I was not interested in getting involved in any of this stuff. So it was unfortunate. I'll send you a copy of the documentary if you like in my book. Yeah, I would like to know more about what you've done. Well, you know, what's interesting is because where I've been, is a, it's almost like a mirror image of what's happening on the timeline. And so far as I see where Big Brother's heading, I see where the artificial intelligence is heading, I see where the transhuman, you know, transhumanism is heading now because of where I've been with the artificial intelligence. And it's really creepy because people don't understand. And I don't want a fear monger, but I'm telling you, you know, there's a technology out there that people have no idea. It's just like the black technology programs, just like the, the black space program. They have no idea what it does, what it's capable of doing, and how it can compromise people and their brains. And I, mm. I think that's, um, you know, if you love your free will and you love your soul and you love your, your spirituality, then you are not going to like what they're doing with this artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really big because I stand up for, for freedom. And that's really big with me. You know, Were freedom. you psychic before or after? Um, I've, yeah, I've always been psychic. I've always been naturally, naturally tuned in and switched on. And when they interconnected me onto the program, they enhanced and booted up a lot of things. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's actually a blessing. 
And because I had a handler and I had people programming me, it was more of a, a redirection and, a, and really them trying to control and manipulate every single thing I was doing. So I didn't appreciate it at all. And mm -hmm. honestly, the work that I was doing prior to being, my induction was much more powerful and, and much more, um, it wasn't compromised. And I won't let right. myself get compromised now, but, but still it's, um, when they take you and they interface you onto an artificial intelligence, they're taking everything, you know, your four body system, your, your spirituality, your, I have a Merkava signal, what I call Merkava, which is based on light body. It's really extensive in mysticism. But they interface it all onto an AI template. So they can use this to clone others, by the way. Um, they have an insidious program. And I, I'm not going to go into it because this is, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. But, but literally, mm. it's, it's high tech. Um, and it's, it's something that's black beyond the word in, in black technology. And I know that there are people out there who understand artificial telepathy. I call it synthetic telepathy. Um, this isn't hearing voices. This isn't madness. There is EEG cloning and heterodyning, which, which literally creates a template that can create a false pattern and a false schizophrenic behavioral pattern onto a target if they're directing it onto a target, which is very concerning because right now you'll see people who are having breakdowns and, oh, this person's hearing voices and they're breaking down and they're shooting people. And then mm -hmm. I look at it and I profile it. I'm like, well, this is tactical hardware. They're using a psychotronic weapon system on the target. They're creating a heterodyning program. They're creating schizophrenic behavioral patterns. You know, he's not hearing voices. He's hearing a mock radio communication system. Mm -hmm. It's, it's huge, and yet you'll never hear a word out of D.C. because they're using it. And I'm probably going to get in trouble now for saying it, but it doesn't matter because I've been talking about this for 10 years now. So, mm -hmm. But anyways, it's a long, it's, a long, uh, it's been a long road. So, but I, I give people a heads up because you want to keep your brain, you want to keep your consciousness, and you want to keep your free will honored. Um, off in that direction just a little bit. The, the Perry Center seems to be the biggest hub for that kind of activity. Um, one day I saw a, um, a Rubicon Jeep, and it had military tags on it. I can't, I have it written down in the book. I don't know exactly what it said right you know, off the top of my head. But it was uh, the psychological uh, warfare uh, tags that mm -hmm. came from Colorado, by the way. Lovely. And, uh, uh, there, you know, this Perry Center is way off the beaten path. So what in the world was that doing, you know, going in that direction, which is what it was doing. Right. And so you just you just have to wonder. And one of the, the men, when he was a, a young man, uh, was working on one of the um, Christmas tree farms that was fairly close to Perry. And he learned about um, animals in cages being taken in there. So if, that's, if that report is true, and he seemed to believe that it was, um, that could be experimentation also. Right, exactly. That's really sad when you think about the animals in general. Well, you know, in the old days when they had MK Ultra, it was, you know, they'd take you and they'd, they'd put you in an area underground somewhere and torture you with lights, drugs, whatever it is they could do, um, you know, electricity to alter you and create alters in your personality. And, and nowadays they don't need that. They can, re they can remotely induct you through the satellite-driven technology. And mm -hmm. when that happens, you can be in your house. Um, you can be anywhere. And they could mm -hmm. tag you, triangulate you, and pull you into the program. Once you're pulled in, you're, you're artificially interfaced with the technology and usually a live handler, four controllers, and programmers. And that can be very serious because it'll ruin your, your lifestyle. It'll ruin your marriages, um, your family, whatever you have. You know, your, everything in your orbit gets taken away immediately. It's, it gets swept away. So it's an extremely serious issue. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, you know, we had MKUltra a long, long time ago, but now they've perfected it. Now they really know what they're doing with it. And that's a problem for everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I address. I'm very adamant about speaking up and speaking out because I don't want to see people swept away. And if you well, want to be transhumanism, if you want to be part machine, I think that's great if that's your free will. But I'll tell you what, you won't like it. I'll mm -hmm. tell you right now. Right. It's not what you think it is. Right. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Well, on your future shows, you'll have to help people come up with uh, positive things they might be able to do to counteract some of this stuff. Right. I yeah. mean, as far as stopping it or stopping the funding for it or you know something right well know. unfortunately the the funding is in black budget technology and it's unlimited and i have addressed it and i did testify in court in 2006 about it but i will say um you know even my lawyer who was connected to nsa told me that this is so black we can't touch it anymore he actually mm -hmm. told me that because we were going to try and wow. go further we couldn't do it but mm -hmm. i'll tell you um it's, it's unfortunate because um, this is something that I think is part of the future and the illusion of the timeline right now. And it's not about fear mongering. It's just about technological enhancement. We are dealing with a world right now where everything is weaponized and it's technologically enhanced. And with that comes upgrades with people, um, upgrades with these wannabe elites. They're upgrading themselves. They're upgrading their DNA through artificial intelligence. Well, that artificial intelligence is a dead end. And, and if they don't like you or if they want to do something to you and, and pull you into a faulty program, 
then they can they can remotely access you and do these things, and it gets swept under the carpet, and the government won't won't do a thing about it. They won't stop mm. it. So I do have a problem with that. So yeah, we're, I do work on solutions, and I do work on um, techno technological solutions, um, shielding, and also things that can disable their their. And I'm sure they hate me for it, but to literally disable whatever they're doing to try to impact a target. In other words, we have to counter that. We can't tolerate this. We are mm. not guinea pigs for this. So, right. Anyways, I don't want to go on and on and on about it, but but yeah. So, and we can talk about it another time too. I'd, I'd like to talk to you yeah. here about it. <laughs> okay. Well, but, we can uplift this conversation a little bit so people don't feel yeah, totally we're going to switch out. around here. We definitely uh, have because we do have a, like a section on the Skyship's website that's just about cosmic miracles and nice. things that are very very uh, encouraging and uplifting. And um, I try to keep a balance on the website uh, so that we're you know doing many different things. We don't just focus on one aspect of the things we're talking about. And I think that's important. Oh, I think so, too. Can you give us an example of the cosmic miracles? A little bit. Uh, let me think here. Uh, there's one, and, you know, we've been talking about Christianity, but, you know, the healing and stuff does, isn't limited to Christianity. And uh, there's a, a, a video that we reference. I do an article, and then you can click on the video if you want to. And it's one of these um, little children who um, can't talk, who drools, who, you know, um, pulls on things, just is totally, totally um, not there, so to speak. And the mother brought this child in front of uh, a man from the Eastern tradition. And um, by the end of the video, the child is making on, uh, eye contact for the first time, is actually suddenly aware of people in the audience, um, actually waves and does some things that it's clear from the, uh, from the video the child was incapable of. And that was in a, a very short amount of time. And that's, that's miraculous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sounds like he was infused with a lot of light, light consciousness energy. Right. Yeah. Well, there's something to be said about the path of the ancient mystery, mystery school teachings if they're transcended to the highest level. And, of course, that's, that's where uh, enlightenment comes from. So right. you know, I'm a firm believer in miracles also and, and it, that anything is possible. And, and, of course, we are infinite beings. And that's another thing, too. I mean, we, I want everybody to ascend to their highest potential and not be, be shut down and switched off. We do have a section called Skyship uh, Messages, uh, which we only get uh, to post, you know, every once in a while. And um, I'm, I'm certainly going to briefly paraphrase this, but the message was that it's so important for each of us to keep our own spiritual awareness and energy as high as possible. And they said it was like, uh, by doing that, you're creating almost like a beam of light that's going up through this big, heavy cloud that covers the earth. And when that penetrates it, at the higher levels, they can see that. So if you needed help, they, they're drawn to the light. So if you want positive um, uh, support and protection uh, from higher realms, the more you do to uplift your own energy, the more it will be visible, you know, in those other realms. And that's a way of uh, uh, tuning in and actually tapping into uh, a greater protection. Right, that makes perfect sense. Did that make sense? Oh, absolutely, know. because you're you're raising your vibrational frequency. You're raising your vibration through higher consciousness, meditation, beliefs, prayer, whatever it is. And, of course, that activates what I call the pillar of light. And, and then, of course, when you talk about visible in other realms, well, as you raise your frequency, you're actually able to access other dimensional spaces and frequencies. Right. So that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, and that's anyhow. a good reminder. That's a really good reminder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Right. And uh, years ago, I wrote a book, which it, we have a lot of subjects in common, and it, uh, it's no longer in print, but it was called uh, Psychics Don't Scare Me Anymore, and I wrote that back in the 80s. At the time, it was timely. It's not a book I would do now because so many things have evolved. Um, but uh, just getting people to open up their psychic ability. Mm-hmm. Right. It's uh, so important. And a lot of people are afraid of that. That's that's the thing. They get scared when they start to see things or if they have a vision of some kind or a premonition and it comes true, you know, and they want to switch it off. But but we are multidimensional and with that comes multidimensional sight and psychic vision yeah, but naturally. People don't realize that they can put the brakes on things. Yep. You can say 
give this to me in a way that I can understand. Give it to me in doses I can comprehend. Um, you can make those kind of requests. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people don't realize it. They think that things just have to happen to you. Um, right. You know, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, it, when I did that first book, Psychics Don't Scare Me Anymore, um, the very first psychic that I ever went to um, was part of a newspaper article I was doing. And she, in hindsight, proved to be a very, very good psychic. But her advice was very simple. You always ask for the highest and the best, but let's use the word creator, and then the, what you need at that moment will be sent. You know, if you're asking for a particular, um, let's say, deceased relative or, you know, some spirit that you know, you can only get what that entity can share with you. Mm-hmm. If you're always asking for the highest and the best, then that is what you will get. Um, right. You know, some people, you know, will, are at the medium level and they just want to ask for their uh, help from their uncle or their grandmother or whatever, and they may, be, may have been wonderful people, but that doesn't mean that they have what you need at that moment. Absolutely. You, yeah, and they could be also imposters, too. There are imposter entities that, that can mask themselves as a relative, which they're not. And when right. I do anything pertaining to mysticism and higher consciousness, it's always my higher self, over soul, super conscious, merged with the full light universe source, whatever you call the divine creator. I don't play around with these lower astral entities and disembodied spirits at all. And right. um, I think people should be very aware that there are a lot of tricksters out there, a lot of disembodied Absolutely. entities. They'll be imposters. They will lie to you. And the sad thing about, not to get over to the covert technology, but I will say there's a weaponization of the paranormal. And with that comes, they can actually adapt onto the paranormal and, and interconnect with somebody through the AI and start creating an entity that's not even real that mm. they'll think is a spirit or a ghost. And literally, it will be part of the uh, communication system paranormal. So, yeah, there's there's just a real insidious programs, I swear. But as right. you say... And that's why you always want to be tuning into the to the highest and yes, the best. Yes, absolutely. Totally. That is, that is people's protection. Yep, you gave it right there. And I'd like to get that book, too. Psychics Don't Scare Me Anymore. That sounds awesome. Is it still in print? It's just a little... T- no, it isn't. No. Aww. Uh, I don't know if it, there's still some available in the, you know, back in used books or something like that. It's a small book. Each chapter was like a standalone um, magazine article. In fact, some of the chapters were printed as magazine articles. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, I, I, I see my role as uh, being a bridge between, you know, ordinary people and those that aren't ordinary. And I've always, in everything I do, it seems to be the the path I've chosen. Right. And you also have that nice grounded energy, which I'm I'm always like I have a resonance with. So you're you're very grounded yet you're very advanced in, in spirituality and consciousness. So that's nice too. You have a nice field. I always say you know, you can't be a flake when you're in this in this area. You have to be really grounded energetically. Well, and and I uh, believe it or not, as open as I am to uh, uh all sorts of phenomena, um I'm still very um uh skeptical. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not ready to believe everything that comes my way, and I also always trust that gut feeling. Right, absolutely, yeah. And how often do you think um, articles come in your, or around your way that that are kind of uh, just just don't have any truth to them? Does that happen a lot? Uh, hopefully, I can weed them out early. Yeah, I think so too. Well, I'm interested in so far as I know that there's been a huge spike in so far as people seeing um, UFO anomalies lately. From what I've uh, done insofar as research and talked to a lot of researchers and investigators, there seems to be a lot of people reporting that they've had more and more sightings. So so I'm wondering what's going on or if it's part of a, a projection of some kind. But I, I get the sense that there is really activity spiking up. Um, like I said, I'm, a, I'm basically an optimist. And I really do believe that there are um, ETs uh, that are very much benevolent and... Um, are here trying to help us. Mm-hmm. And if things get real crucial, I think that will become increasingly evident. I think you're right about that. Well, I always say we, we are our ancestors, and that means we are our star people ancestors, you know. Mm-hmm. And we can't forget that. I think somehow people forget their lineage, their celestial, what I call celestial heritage, which is huge. Mm-hmm. If they only understood that we're part of that network, that big, big multiverse out there, and we're all connected in there, and... I mean, that's where all the answers lie. That's where, where the majority of the uh, the truth is. Absolutely. 
Yeah, without a doubt. So let's touch base with your books again. I know we can get them on Amazon.com. Once again, let's talk about the new book and, and when that when you think it's going to go live in July. Um, it went to the printer yesterday. So I should probably have it by next week. Wonderful. I do not know how much of a delay it will take to go through the Amazon process to get it on uh, Amazon. But um, I will try to make that happen as quickly as possible. So it should be up, you know, after, ideally after the 4th of July, I would hope, sometime. Oh, that'll be nice so timing. That, then the, uh, that's uh, called, uh, I should get the names in here, Underground Military Bases Hidden in North Carolina Mountains. So that's the one that will be coming out. Last year I did the book, Cherokee Little People Were Real. Um, Again, I hope it gets into the hands of some archaeologists and people who want to do further investigations. Um, I've already um, talked to people who have found other tunnels since then. Um, uh, It's also a wonderful guidebook for people who want to enjoy these mountains because you can uh, do some exploring with the book in hand uh, because there's actual maps and things like that. Um, So that's a second book. The third book is Tangible Evidence of Jesus, and again, it is packed with uh, information in easy-to-swallow form, um, with information which uh, is not part of regular teachings, but only enhances it. It doesn't take away from it. It doesn't diminish it. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three books that, um, well, two that are on Amazon right now, and the other one will be. The psychic book is has been out of print for a number of years, and you'd probably have to find it, uh, you know, in used books somewhere. But uh, nice. that was written for a time. You know, that was a time when that was a hot item. Right. It is not a book that would be as hot an item now as mm-hmm. it would have been back in the late 80s. Yeah, that's interesting because when I write books, too, I wrote one like in 2004. It was written for the timeline it was on. But if I look back at some of the work that I do, I could easily edit some of it. But but it was written for the timeline, and you can see the timelines as they ascend. It's it's quite interesting when you're writing books in general. Do you do lectures as well? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the biggest one that I've done was uh, with Evelyn Gordon, who is a co-owner of the the website, and we spoke at the International UFO Congress out in Nevada um, to an audience of you know between over nine nine hundred people. So that would have been the biggest audience. Uh, Do a a number of lectures, you know, within driving distance. And, of course, then you have much smaller audiences. Um, Do a lot of the radio, which is wonderful because you can sit back in the rocking chair and be somewhat comfortable and and just have a chat. Right. And occasionally I've done some television. Nice. That's awesome. I'll tell you, it's been a pleasure to have you on tonight. So wonderful. I so appreciate what you're doing. And it's been a pleasure and I do want to have you back at some point in the continuum when you're ready to come back. Make sure you come back. Okay. Sure. And also, we're, we're, we have about 10 minutes here, plus or minus the illusion of time, which really doesn't exist anyway. Uh, what has been the most interesting investigation you've ever researched? Mm. Well, the most interesting current one is what's going on right now with the uh, Valley of the Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. And uh, all the mysteries there have not been solved yet, so that's certainly at the top of my list. Uh, interviewing military people who have inside information on these underground facilities is fascinating. And the ones that are featured primarily in the book would be um, Mount Mitchell, um, the Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, the Pisgah Astronomical uh, Research uh, uh, Institute, which is known as Perry. Another one that I haven't mentioned tonight is uh, uh, at the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, which is near Chimney um, State Park, Chimney Rock State Park. And, you know, some fascinating stuff has gone on up there. And so there's uh, major chapters on each one of the ones that I've mentioned. <clears throat> Another one in passing that's in one of the chapters is about uh, one in the Linville Gorge. Anybody who is familiar with uh, the mountains of western North Carolina is going to know the names that I've mentioned, with the exception of probably Perry. Mm-hmm. Um, and each one is just a little bit more, you know, has is unique in its own way. And uh, uh, one of the gals who lives up to at the very, or it did at the time, lived at the very top of, uh, one of the last homes at the top of the mountain on Sugarloaf. And uh, 
she talked about helicopters coming in at night with the floodlights and dropping earth moving equipment and working throughout the night and she said the next day that the shape of the mountain had changed um, mm. very mysterious uh, vehicles go up and down through there on a regular basis while I interviewed her at her house there was a, a white unmarked um, uh, SUV that went by slowly and then turned around at the end of the road and came back slowly again and, and you know, making us all feel like they knew what we were doing. Uh. And she had the uh, the guts to go up and cross into where this entrance is to the facility and she could see tire tracks disappear into uh, what appeared to be a solid wall. And... Uh, you know, that can't happen because if you're driving a vehicle, the bumper and the front end is going to keep the tires from going right up and disappearing into the wall. Right. So somehow that wall, you know, must have moved and probably went into an elevator. Mm-hmm. And she also saw uh, UFO activity uh, directly related to that. And she referred to uh, positive and negative uh, UFOs, I mean, uh, ETs, uh, which she you know, I guess, actually interacted with to some degree. That's interesting. Do you think the ETs were there first and then the facility? And the UFOs? Uh, uh, pro- my guess would be no, no? but I don't okay. know. I'm wondering if they're attracting these these UFOs. or I mean, obviously we talked about them being, you know, possibly ours. Or if they're actually drawing in these, these types of craft. I think that our military is involved with aliens mm-hmm. or ETs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense right there. But I don't think they're going to be very good if they're misusing technology, I'll tell you right now. Bye. Yeah. Yep. So if that's the case, then we have a problem, Houston. Right. <laughs> and I, I also want to emphasize, uh, people need to know that the, uh, the ETs that are doing the abductions and scaring the pants off of people, those are not the good guys. And the ones that are Pleiadian or Arcturian or, you know, uh, what I call the good guys, they're not doing that to people. Correct. And they're, they, they just are not. Right. No, I agree. And, uh, yeah, they're light beings. They're, 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 they, that species you were referencing, the Pleiadians and the Arcturians, they're light consciousness beings. They, they don't misuse anything. They're love consciousness oriented. Right. And uh, uh, really uh, very um, positive, pleasant uh, telepathic communication. Right, yeah. Oh, I know the difference between natural telepathy and artificial telepathy. Let me tell you, it's uh, not even the same animal. Mm-hmm. Not at all. What you were touching on also is my labs because um, military abductions, of course, that's a mix. So that makes a lot of sense. When these people are getting abducted and, and things are happening to them that's not appropriate, that's definitely a my lab. Right. So, yeah. And I think that's the, you know, if somebody is having those kind of experiences, that's the time to be sent. You don't have to do it out loud. That's the time to mentally be sending out, you know, SOS calls to Absolutely. the good guys. I agree. Yeah, work with the good ones for sure. I do. Because and so many people who are being abducted are just letting it happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they can't. I mean, it's not one of these things where, I mean, I understand the no fear factor, but you literally have to set your barriers up and your shields up and, and stay on a higher frequency, what we're talking about, higher dimensional states of consciousness and pure energy is very important. You know, we're getting ready to wrap this up. I can't believe it. It's been such a pleasure to have you on, Mary Joyce. Okay, I enjoyed it too. It's been a a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it's been an honor, and I do want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. And also, please stay tuned for Dr. J Radio Live coming up next year on the Dark Matter Radio. Oh, I can't call it Digital Network. Yes, that's it. Digital Network. I like the sound of it. So, is there anything you'd like to uh, touch base with? I know we have maybe a minute or two here. We have about two minutes plus or minus. Anything you'd like to, to say to the listeners tonight? Uh, don't be afraid. Seek out the the, uh, the good guys. Seek out the uh, uh, the Indians. I love their term. They always refer to uh, the ultimate energy as the creator. Uh, I think that's a nice uh, kind of term to use. Uh, and seek out seek out the good and focus on the good. Uh, that draws the good to you. And uh, if you have a bad experience, stand up to it. You do not need to put up with it. Absolutely. And the only other plug I would give is um, check in with the um, the website, Sky Ships Over Cashers. Uh, we've updated uh, uh, just about every week since 2008. Even the archives will have uh, information that would be new to, to a great many people. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I guess that would be my final plug. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much. And of course, uh, keep me posted on that Bigfoot DNA. I'm curious to to find out what's going on with that. So so make sure you let us all know. All righty. We certainly will. And you have a good evening. And you too. And thank you so much. And once again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. And thank you, Keith. And I think we're just about ready to roll out of here. If I'm not mistaken. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, Keith.